My name is Gregory Gauz. I'm the head of the International Affairs Department at the Bush School of Government and Public Service here at Texas A&M. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here today for our lecture and conversation with Professor Wendy Perlman. Professor Perlman is Associate Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, where she also holds the Martin and, Pat and Patricia Koldike Outstanding Teaching Professorship and is a faculty fellow at the Buffett Institute for Global Studies at Northwestern. She received her PhD from Harvard University, her MA from Georgetown University, and her BA from Brown University. No Texas institutions in there, but that's all right. We'll, <laughs> we'll still welcome her down here to Aggieland. She's the author of, of, uh, of three books, two of which were on uh, Palestinian politics, Violence, Nonviolence, and the Palestinian National Movement, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. And her first book, Occupied Voices, Stories of Everyday Life from the Second Intifada, was published in 2003. She's also published in a number of academic journals related to the Middle East, migration issues, and also some of the major journals in political science, international security, the Journal of Conflict Resolution, security studies, and, the stu and studies in comparative international development. Uh, she is the recipient of a number of fellowships, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Research Fellowship, which takes her to Berlin for her summers. Uh, I don't know which is better, Chicago in the summer or Berlin in the summer, but it's certainly better than Syria in the summer. Uh, she has also had fellowships at the United States Institute of Peace, at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, at the Kennedy School at Harvard. She studied and conducted research throughout the Middle East. She's here today to speak to us about her current book, we Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled, Voices from Syria, which was published in 2017. It's based on interviews that she's conducted since 2012 with Syrian refugees. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about the book, even though I'm two-thirds of the way through it, because uh, Professor Perlman will do that. It's a great pleasure to welcome to College Station and the Bush School, Professor Wendy Perlman. Thank you so much for having me here. Is the sound okay? Can everyone hear me? Great. I don't know if I can see you over this, this mic, but it is such a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for that introduction for having me here. So yeah, let me just jump into telling you about this book. So the story begins with me beginning um, to study the Middle East and study Arabic during a college semester abroad in North Africa in 1995. So I continued studying the Middle East and studying Arabic. After that, eventually got my PhD in political science. So like most regional specialists, or most of you, or most people on the planet, I was captivated in 2011 with these mass shows of protests that came to be known as the Arab Arab Spring. And I wanted to know what it felt like for people who were going out and protesting, many of them for the first time. I wanted to know what pushed people to the streets, what it felt like to protest, how it was transforming them as individuals, how that was transforming the countries of the Arab world. And to get that kind of human micro perspective on the protests, I knew that I had to zoom down from hundreds of feet above Tahrir Square to get to the human level. I wanted to know people's stories and thought that there was no better way than to ask them for their stories. I was having these thoughts about the human dimension of the Arab Spring as I watched protests, and we all did, that began in Tunisia and then spread to Egypt and then from there to Yemen and to Bahrain and so forth. And many commenters at the time said the protests won't spread to Syria. Syria is a kingdom of silence. So outside observers and even many Syrians of themselves said Syrians are simply too afraid. The regime is too strong. The military is too infused with the regime. This history of violence by the state against citizens makes people too afraid. These protests might go everywhere else in the region, but they won't happen in Syria. So when protests did break out in Syria, I was especially captivated to know what was it like, what drove Syrians also, in spite of everything, to go out and protest and call for change. 
I got my first chance to go and ask Syrians in 2012. By that time, it was already quite dangerous to go inside Syria, or at least it was too dangerous for me to go inside Syria and have frank conversations with Syrians about politics and their experiences. So I began to interview Syrians who had fled the country as refugees. I began in Jordan in 2012, returned to Jordan in 2013, and then moved on to Turkey, and eventually to Lebanon, did some interviews in the United Arab Emirates. And then as the large wave of migrants moved on to Europe, I also went on to Europe, um, where I now summer in Berlin, and, um, and talked to, to Syrians and others who'd made that trip to, to Europe. My interviews were open-ended. They varied from 30-minute conversations to group conversations with many displaced Syrians speaking amongst themselves and me audio recording. And sometimes there were long personal testimonials in which someone would tell me the story of his or her life over several hours or several days, and sometimes over continents when I would reconnect with the same person years later after he or she had moved on to another place and filled me in on how his or her life had changed. While my interviewees varied by age and socioeconomic class and gender and region and hometown, the overwhelming majority of people with whom I spoke identified as being opposed to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. In that sense, I can say that this book in no way represents the full spectrum of the Syrian population, and especially the voices of regime supporters, and also the voices of those who remain in the country, as opposed to those who eventually fled. But at the same time, I feel that it represents a part of the population that meets with too few opportunities to represent itself to speak in its own words, to say what this uprising and war and exile experience has been like for them on a human level. I collected and collected these stories, speaking with over 300 Syrians over the years, and as time went by, I could see how the individual narratives coalesced into a collective narrative, expressing what this experience has been like for this cross-section of the Syrian population. The book that I've written expresses this collective narrative. The introduction is in my voice that provides some basic historical context about uh, Syrian history, and the rest of it is, consists exclusively of the words of Syrians themselves. It's divided in eight parts that go chronologically, and e within each, it's a curation of testimonials, excerpts from the long interviews I collected, put in a sequence that I hope will walk readers through the story of the Syrian war, from the origins of what life was like in Syria before 2011, through to the start of nonviolent protests in 2011, their escalation to this brutal, multi-sided war that continues until today. So in creating this book, my work was very different from my normal day job as a political scientist. Uh, it was more like curating an exhibit, an exhibit of words, or making something of a mosaic of stories that could tell uh, the, a story even bigger than each individual story, so that the sum was bigger than the parts. So what I'd like to do with today is share a selection of those voices to walk you through some of this historical chronology, a sense of Syria as, again, how this cross-section of Syrians have lived this experience. And I'll move with the chronology of the book. The book then begins with a section called Authoritarianism. Here, to begin, in 1970, after decades of coups and instability, General Hafez al-Assad seized power in Syria. There is much to say and much that has been said about how he fortified a strong authoritarian regime using the design of various institutions and strategies and policies and coalitions. The stories in this book, however, focus on the lived experience of authoritarianism, what it was like for ordinary citizens, and these stories emphasize how a single ruling political party, an omnipresent security apparatus, a pervasive network of covert informants, all combined to police society and encourage society to police 
itself. For many citizens, this was embodied in the collective memory surrounding the events of Hama in 1982, which refers to how when the regime faced uh, both various forms of unarmed and armed protest and opposition in the late 1970s to early 1980s, culminating in an insurrection by the Muslim Brotherhood, the most organized opposition force on the ground at the time, in the town of Hama. The Assad regime launched a scorched earth crackdown against this insurrection, sending in tanks and troops, flattening entire neighborhoods, killing up to tens of thousands, some say even 40,000 civilians and others, many of whom had nothing to do with the uprising or the Muslim Brotherhood, and in many ways warning an entire generation, this is what the regime might do to those who dare to stand up to power. A 20-something named Mohammed described to me the effect of Hama in his own imagination. He said, Hafez al-Assad tamed the Syrian people by using security and military rule. It was like when you have a wild animal that you want to make a pet. Syria became a big farm. For Syrians, life meant waking up every morning, going to work, and coming home at the end of the day, he killed political life. The regime not only used violence or threat of violence to gain obedience, but also corruption and co-optation. Here, Iham, who years later would become a web developer, remembered this from his childhood in Damascus. He said, the brainwashing process starts when you go to school. We love the leader, we love the regime. Without them, the country will collapse. You grow up with that in the back of your head, constantly reminding you that we are living due to the grace of the Assad family. But even as an innocent child, you see that the whole system just reeked. It fed on corruption and grew. If you want to get a passport, you have to bribe this guy or that guy. From when you're little, you're taught that this is the only way to survive in this country. Everything is handled by how loyal you are to the regime. So you're raised on the principle that you have to show your loyalty. Hafez al-Assad died in the year 2000, and his son Bashar came to power. And many believed that this young, educated head of state would make change. And he portrayed himself as a reformer and modernizer. And in many ways, there was change, chiefly in the economic realm and the shift from a state-dominated economy to a more neoliberal, market-oriented economy, which in many ways allowed corruption to grow worse. But still, the threat of punishment, should you challenge power remained. Here, Saleh, a landscaper, put it in these terms, saying, we don't have a government. We have a mafia. And if you speak out against this, it's off with you to Beit Khaltu, your aunt's house. That's an expression we have. It means to take someone to prison. It means forget about this person. He'll be tortured. You'll never hear from him again. This sense of the punishment that lurked should you dare to challenge is best captured in the expression that I heard again and again from Syrians, which is that people were raised on the idea that hush, the walls have ears, meaning you don't know who's listening, Maybe even your brother or your cousin could be a spy. There is danger everywhere. It's better not even to talk about politics. You don't know what trouble it could get you into. And as people spoke about this expression, hush the walls have ears, I came to see that it was not simply a form of rule, how an authoritarian leader kept power. It could be constitutive of a sense of self, of people's sense of self and being in the world a disposition to silence that could be so internalized, maybe even people kept it after they left the country. To describe that, here Hassam, 
who left the Damascus suburbs as a child in the 1980s, describing his contact with Syrians who also left in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, even if they were just leaving Syria for a visit. And he said, When you meet somebody coming out of Syria for the first time, you start to hear the same sentences. Everything is okay. Syria is a great country. The economy is doing great. It'll take him like six months, up to a year, to become a normal human being, to say what he thinks, what he feels. Then he might start whispering. They won't speak loudly. It's too scary. After all that time, even outside Syria, you feel that someone is recording. For sure, there were transgressions. People stood up to power and pushed the boundaries of political permissibility in ways big and small, and these varied over the years. But for many people I spoke with, there was a sense that corruption and repression simply limited the horizons of possibility. To hope for change seemed foolish. To fight for change seemed reckless. It would probably only get you and maybe even your family members in the worst kinds of trouble. As expressed by a drama student whose words open the book, a Syrian citizen is just a number. Dreaming is not allowed. Until, of course, Syrians dared to dream. As we know, protests in the Arab world began in Tunisia and Egypt, spreading January, February 2011. And the book describes how Syrians intently watched these protests in other countries, talked amongst themselves, wondering if it would happen in Syria as well. And then the book uses a series of stories to trace the series of small events by which first tentative demonstrations grew and spread and were sustained over time, becoming a nationwide revolt that called first for regime reform and eventually for regime change. And I'm happy to talk about that timeline of events, but for now would like to focus on what protest meant to those who participated in it. And I think that's captured best in another expression that became ubiquitous in Syria at the time, in other countries of the Arab world as well, which is that people were able to protest because they, quote, broke the barrier of fear. What does it mean to break the barrier of fear, to muster the courage to go out and protest? What comes through in the stories that I collected is not that fear ever disappeared, but that people became able to protest despite fear. They worked through fear. To capture that, here's a testimonial from Shireen, a mother in her mid-30s from Aleppo. And she said, Oppression was residing in us. It was part of our life, like air, sun, water, we didn't even feel it. Like air is there, and you never ask, where is the air? But then, in one second, in one shout, in one voice, you blow it up. You defy it and stand in front of death. You have an inheritance, and after 30 years, you slam it on the ground and shatter it. Don't even imagine that it was easy to go out to a demonstration. No amount of courage allows you to just stand there and watch someone who has a gun and is about to kill you. But still, this incredible oppression made us go out. I encouraged my nieces and nephews to come with me to demonstrations. I felt that if they didn't try that experience, they'd be missing the real meaning of life. When you chant, you shudder, and your body rises, and everything you imagined just comes out. Tears come down, tears of joy, because I broke the barrier. I am not afraid. I am a free being. Sadness and happiness and fear and courage, 
They're all mixed together in that voice, and it comes out strong. Before the revolution, Syria was just the place where I lived, but it didn't belong to me. When the revolution began, I discovered that Syria was my country. Nearly everyone with whom I spoke who participated in demonstrations identified it as an experience that was not simply emotional, but transformative. I would ask people to describe their first demonstration. And what I heard most frequently was la tusef. It's simply indescribable. And I would say, okay, I'm writing a book. I work in words here. Can you try to put it into words? Try to describe it. And people would say things like, it was the first time I breathed, the first time I felt like a human, the first time I felt like a Syrian citizen. One man said, it was better than my wedding day. And then my wife heard me say that. She refused to speak to me for a month. <laughs> I think this sense that it was like the first time for me is best captured in a testimonial from Rima, a writer from Sueda, who said, I was in a demonstration, and I started to whisper, freedom, and then I started to hear myself repeating, freedom, 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 and then I started shouting, freedom, and I thought, this is the first time I have ever heard my own voice, and I told myself that I would never let anyone steal my voice again. This, I think, is what the Syrian uprising meant to those who supported it, who participated in it, who championed it. And I think it's important to remember, because as time goes by, that truth is, I think, increasingly forgotten and buried under what becomes, then, the next phase of the Syrian uprising. As we know, the regime responded to what were at the time mostly peaceful protests with repression. The opposition eventually took up arms responding to that regime. And those who took up arms and became part of an increasingly armed rebellion explain that choice. Here, the words of a free Syrian army fighter who goes by the alias Captain explained. And he said, when demonstrations began, security forces came. We agreed that if they were going to shoot bullets, then we needed weapons, too. We were only chanting in the streets. We could have chanted for the rest of our lives without anyone even paying attention to us. But when the regime started attacking us, a lot of people who were on the sidelines started to join and protest, too, because of the blood. Blood is what moves people. Blood is the force of the revolution. As the armed rebellion expanded, the regime escalated its reprisals. State and non-state parties intervened with various different agendas and goals and patrons. And the conflict evolved to this full-fledged, multi-sided, and brutal war that we see continuing until today. The book describes the experiences of civilians living war. And what I find in their stories is something like two different, almost contradictory experiences of living war. On the one hand, war is terror, ro'ob, people would say. People described shelling and bombing. Often people would say how the sounds of war are as fearsome as the actual explosions, carrying the planes above and not knowing when they would drop a bomb or where, and just simply waiting. And families described hiding in basements or underground shelters, at the same time knowing that there was nowhere to hide, especially from aerial bombardment. So war is terror. But on the other hand, there's a kind of normalization of terror. It becomes like the backdrop of daily life. You have to get used to the fact that you could die at any time. That's what it means to live under a war like this. So what are these aspects of the normalization of war? On the one hand, there are a war and the normalization becoming ingrained into the very landscape of life. So we've all seen pictures like this 
of rubble, people described to me how often people could not bury the bodies of loved ones who were killed and had to bury bodies in backyards or in gardens and parks. So literally the spaces of most everyday life were marked by death. Another way that I saw the normalization of terror and war was in people talking about the experiences of their children. One mother said, even my three-year-old knows the differences between different missiles and bullets from their sounds. This is just what she hears day in and day out. Karim, a doctor from Homs, described to me the experience of his young son. And he said, my son spent the first years of his life stuck inside because of the curfew and the bombing in Homs. He had no contact with anyone but his parents and grandparents. He was two years old when he saw another child for the first time. He went up to him and touched his eyes. He thought that he was a doll. Another way that people became normalized to violence and war is through a kind of immunity to shock. Whether it's real or simply professed, people would again and again would say things to me like, simply nothing can shock us anymore after all we've seen. To give expression to that, hear the words from Abu Firas, another free Syrian arm, army fighter from Idlib, who said, at first, one or two people were killed, then 20. Then it became normal. If we lost 50 people, we'd say, thank God, it's only 50. It's been so long since I've heard that somebody died of natural causes. There's so much more to say about this normalization of living under war, but I'll conclude with one last element, and that is humor. I think there's a lot that has been said and still left to be said about the role of humor and satire in the Syrian uprising. Um, in some ways, it's how people are able to make sense of this tragedy. Um, so here to give you just some sense of this kind of dark humor that's come out of the Syrian context, I'll share the words of Shafiq, who's someone whose story appears in quite length in the book, but here from something he wrote on his Facebook wall. And he posted one day, the most important and beautiful thing about the revolution is that people rid themselves of the words, hush, the walls have ears. To which one of his friends commented, yeah, that's true, but there are no more walls left anyway. Everything's gone. So moving from these stages of authoritarianism to protest to war, the next stage, at least for the many people I interviewed, was that of displacement and exile. So a bit of context, if the population of Syria before 2011 is estimated around 22 million, approximately, and all these numbers are estimates that often change, some nearly 7 million are internally displaced, Syrians who have been forced to flee their homes but are still living within the borders of Syria. Some 5.4 million are refugees in the border countries surrounding Syria, primarily in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, but also smaller numbers in Iraq and Egypt as well. Some 1 million are seeking asylum in the various countries of Europe. And to put that in perspective, the estimates are around 20,000 have been resettled in the United States. So that puts our tallies in comparison to the kind of burden that is, is being borne, especially by the poorer countries of the region, but uh, other countries of the world as well. The stories in the book describe the journey of becoming a refugee, how one makes it out of Syria in the first place, something that's become increasingly difficult now as the borders, uh, countries surrounding uh, Syria have their borders primarily closed and people cannot even get out at this point but describing how people become refugees and then their challenge and hopes once they are a refugee, trying to start their life anew wherever they found themselves. Many, many stories that really vary by where people have wound up, but all emphasize that the struggle does not end when people reach a place of relative safety. Rather, it's a new cycle of challenges that come underway. To describe that, I'll share the words of Hadia, who I, a refugee who I met in Chicago. Because we're in an academic environment, she also came on an academic fellowship, and she'll describe her experiences. 
So she said, 12 of us Fulbrighters from Syria came to the U.S. in 2010. No one had any intention of staying. We were happy to have this opportunity and then go back home. And then the revolution began. I tried very, very hard to get all the details I could from my cousins and my brother who were in Damascus. I had this thirst to know so I could pretend that I was living through their stories. At school, people kept telling me, at least you're safe. That word, safe, drove me crazy. I wanted to scream, you don't get it. This is a historic moment. I need to be there. My mom and brother got visas to visit the U.S. for my graduation. My mom was planning on staying only a month. But while she was here, the regime started bombing just minutes from our home, back home in Damascus. We kept postponing her return ticket. We never thought that she'd stay this long. As mom always says, she came with one suitcase and never said goodbye to people. Winter came, and I told my mom, let's go get you a coat. She said, I can't believe I'm going to buy things while people are dying in Syria. I'd say, we have to. It's Chicago, and it's cold. She'd say, but I have all those coats back home in Syria. It's the small things like that. They become like rocks on your chest. You can't buy a sandwich without thinking, how much is this sandwich? If that money were sent home to Syria, my role is different from the people on the inside. But I need to do something. I have this responsibility to tell people what's happening on the other side of the world. The book concludes with a section called Reflections, a series of reflections and stories of series, series trying to make sense of all that they've lived, this journey. And in making sense, I find that Syrians articulate pained reflections. These range from anger with what they see as the indifference of the international community to their plight, to nostalgia for a Syria that no longer exists, to a sense of existential instability, both personal and collective, before a profoundly unknown future. This insecurity and uncertainty takes many forms. One form is a kind of ambivalence about the rebellion itself, as there's an awareness that the groups that are strongest on the ground today among the opposition have agendas very different from the original civic goals of the uprising. To describe this, here Maher from the town of Amuda said to me in 2013 at a time when few Americans had even heard of ISIS, that he said, I went out, I was arrested, I worked, I demonstrated, and then ISIS comes along or some other group comes and little by little, steers things in the wrong direction. You did all these things for the revolution, and you see that things are only getting worse. Fear of the regime was broken, and then there started to be fear of the revolution itself. Along similar lines, Syrians again and again would express their awareness that the conflict has been so penetrated by different foreign non-Syrian agendas, that Syrians would say to me, the conflict is simply not in our hands anymore. Here, Khalil, a military defector from Deir Azur, said, many countries have interests in Syria, and they're all woven together like threads in a carpet. We don't know where this is leading. All we know is that we're everyone else's battlefield. The activists with whom I spoke, those who participated and sacrificed and gave so much to this cause, have a lot of heart-wrenching ache as they look at this dark scenario on the ground. 
Um, and many activists, of course, continue to do really tremendous work in education, in relief, in medical support, and in governance, all sorts of activities both inside Syria and outside Syria working for the dream of a freer place. But even as they work, many wrestle with feelings of perhaps guilt, perhaps regret, wondering if it was wrong that they even rose up in the first place. To describe that, here Marcel, an activist from Aleppo, she said these words to me. I belong to the revolution generation, and I'm proud of that. We tried our best to build something. We faced a lot, and we faced it alone, but we lost control. We don't know anymore what's useful. Most of us now are disappointed and depressed. I ask myself, are we a cause of all that's happened? Should we have done things differently? Should we have done nothing at all? So many sources of pain, but perhaps the greatest source of pain or fear that I find among the Syrians with whom I speak is fear for loved ones. Their family members who are now scattered across continents, those who still remain in Syria in harm's way, and perhaps most of all, those loved ones who were arrested or kidnapped and simply have not been heard from again. And family members wait day in and day out for some source of information to know if that loved one is alive or not. This came to the foremost, clear, foremost clearly for me in January 2014 with the revelation of tens of thousands of images documenting what appears to be systematic torture in the prisons of the Assad regime. These were smuggled out by a regime defector who goes by the name Caesar. These pictures have been analyzed by forensic experts. They've been shown on the floor of the Congress and the United Nations and so forth. Um, they're all there for us to see and to, to learn from. Um, and when they were first revealed in January 2014, a Syrian colleague of mine named Hani penned these words about his experience before these images. And he said, the most difficult part of the torture pictures is not the decomposed flesh, the starved bodies, even the knowledge that torture is both widespread and systematic. These have always been elements of our Syrian reality. What is so difficult that I do not think that we have the strength to overcome is the fear that some of these pictures may show us the body of someone we know and we hope is still alive. What does this mean? What are the lessons for Syrians or for us? The last testimony I'll read is from a young man named Adam from Latakia, reflecting. And he said, one of the most profound things that I've learned from this experience that they call the Syrian Civil War is that there's no ultimate right or wrong. It's all shades of gray. The process of finding out what a country needs is never clean. Of course, when you're in a stable country with functioning institutions, it's easy to have a moral code. But these values are only possible because other people did dirty things to put them in place. We opened a Pandora's box. We had this innocent childlike interest to see what was inside the box. We thought we'd get a present, and what we got was all the evil in the world. Now we need to close the box again, but it's going to take a while. Now I'm working with an NGO that helps the free media inside Syria. I see my job as trying to support people who want to make their dreams come true. But I'm too old to dream now. In a month and a half, I'll be 29. In conclusion, why listen to Syrian testimonials? Why collect them? Why read them? Why continue to gather them um, from more and more Syrians? I'll end with a, a few, few points. 
One, I think it's useful to think about these testimonials and learn from them as a form of history, documenting history as lived experience. We can study and analyze historical and political events with a whole array of different types of sources and materials, but personal testimonials, how ordinary people have lived and been affected by these events, is an important way of understanding and appreciating what's at stake in events like this in the most human of terms. Second, Syria, it said, is one of the worst humanitarian crises of our times. There's a debate about what the U.S. should have done or still might do. There are no easy solutions. But in debating them, I hope we all form opinions informed by empathy for the ordinary people whose lives have been transformed by these events, transformed by violence, and we don't lose sight of what it means to them. Thirdly, many displaced by the war in Syria are becoming new neighbors in countries and communities across the world. And Texas is the third largest recipient of Syrian refugees in the United States. So they're here too. To truly welcome these new Syrian neighbors, I think it's important to know who they are, to learn what they carry with them. And there's no better way, I think, than to ask them and hear their stories. And finally, as we learn from and hear Syrians' voices, I hope we come to approach them not with fear or with pity, but with respect. In the words of one woman from Aleppo, whose testimony is near the closing of the book, every Syrian has a hundred stories in his heart. Every Syrian is himself a story. Syrians have gone through a dangerous, painful, and courageous journey to be able to tell their own stories. The very least we can do is listen. I'll close there. Thank you very much. Folks who have uh, uh, had the patience to, to come out after, <laughs> after a day of work to listen to, to an academic talk about uh, a horrible topic, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. it really is. But, but the horribleness of this is mm -hmm. it's mitigated, at least in the, in the section of the book, on, on the revolt itself, where it really is joy and happiness that infuses all of these stories about these people. And you, you represented that, mm -hmm. I think. And I know you've thought a lot about yeah. how emotions yeah. play into political mobilization. So, so what does mobilize people? Is it joy or is it anger? I mean, what, what, what <laughs> yeah. drove Syrians to the streets? Because we tend yeah. to think it's, a, it's anger. It's uh -huh. anger at the regime. When we right. look at the whole uh, the Arab Spring, it's anger at the regime. But I didn't right. see much anger in that section. Mm -hmm. So what's the relationship there with driving people to the streets? Yeah, I think the anger might come through the stories about militarization and why people eventually take up arms. That's often mm -hmm. with a sense of anger, with a mm -hmm. sense of fighting bullets with bullets, as the testimony mm -hmm. said. Um, you know, it's interesting. This, I think, gives a, sense of a backdrop for the book as well. I began this project not necessarily wanting to write a popular book of mm -hmm. testimonials. I began with this very question what drives people to participate in high-risk protest? And I thought that if I collected stories about high-risk protest, I would be able to see some sort of patterns. So I talked to Syrians and Syrians about their experiences, and I found things so all over the map. I'm thinking, I'm a, I'm a political scientist. I want to come up with a theory. I want to come up with an explanation. It defied for me that search for a single theory so I threw the search for theory out the window and ended up writing a book of just stories. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I thought that the stories said what uh, I couldn't impose a theory upon. And there really was a, a full range. But there's a lot of really positive emotions. People would describe the joy of protesting. Those who were maybe too afraid to protest would describe seeing others who were braver, who went out first, and their joy and watching that euphoria, that expression, and thinking to themselves something along the lines of, I want to experience that too. Look at that person. Um, I want to experience that too. Um, they're interesting. There's often, sometimes I even found gender dynamics of, there are several stories I, would, I hear around men saying things like, maybe I, one guy was too afraid to protest, and he saw another man protesting and would say, what, is, that, is he a man and I'm not a man? 
I feel dared, I have to go protest too. And then people would describe the same thing when they saw a woman go out and protest. And then these guys were like, what? I'm scared out of my mind, but she's protesting? No way, I have to go out. So I think that there are a lot of, there might be, there, for many Syrians uh, I talked to, there was a sense of being on the fence. People felt like in their hearts they wanted to go out and say no. They wanted to go out and say, we want change. But of course they were scared to death because the, the consequences were huge. So what is it that pushes people past that barrier of fear? Sometimes it's something in the moment of being inspired by another person, of being challenged by another person, of having emotions take over. There's a story of one woman who describes almost a kind of out-of-body experience of, of just her body moving and merging into the crowd without thinking was her, while her friends try to hold her back. Mm -hmm. So I think there are things that um, certainly defy some that may be said of the kind of rational, concrete calculus right. of costs and benefits right. that we often appeal to in the social sciences. Uh, there's a level of emotion and a level of spontaneity and a level of, of a psyche that takes over when people are pushed to do something which in many ways is defying death, um, but they go and they do it anyway. Do you think that this happiness, this kind of joy that people yeah. felt, kind of didn't prepare them for the, for the consequences, though? Did it leave them perhaps even more exposed to the, the brutality of the regime? And then the militarization and the capture of, of this revolution by, by forces that, you know, maybe were not mm -hmm. representative of the mass uh, demonstrations that began it. Yeah, I, I, I think that that is possible, that there was, um, I think, a level of, of, of just psychological release that, um, I, I, when people told me about protests, it was almost as if at that moment, with people dancing and singing and the, and the sheer joy of it, that they maybe lost sight of, of some of the bigger calculations. In a moment like that, you feel like you can do anything, and you feel like we can do everything. And... Um, and the reality was a much starker uh, outcome that was not determined by people's sense of power, by the reality of the balance of power, who had weapons and who didn't, and whose interests were such. So, um, and, and organization. And, right. and organization and leadership and the ability to... Um, that I think that people were, uh, were, were unprepared. And there's, there's a, a, a great testimony in the book in which a young man said, you know, we watched Egypt. And when Egypt first went out, we said... Egypt's more ready than we are. Egypt had labor unions and Facebook yep. groups and associations and some sort of history of small protests. And he said, we knew that we were not Egypt. They were ready for, for an uprising and we weren't. And he said, and my friends and I got together and we said, we think we need five more years to get ready to pull off an uprising. And we're going to start planning and working. And he said, and then there was a call to go out. And people went out just like that. And were we going to say, wait, we're not ready. We yeah. need to press pause and go back and plan and strategize and think about the regional dynamics and so forth. He said, no, it was released and, and we ran with it. So I think even for, for many who ran with it, there was an awareness that things could be, the odds might be against them. But for many Syrians, I think, who wanted to seize this chance, there was a, a question of, you know, how, how many how often does a chance like this come around? If Syrian said things like, if we don't seize this opportunity now in 2011, when the region is ready for it, when everybody's waiting for it, when people are primed, um, if we don't take it now, will we ever get this chance again? So there was a bit of a, of a gamble, and then things escalated, and, 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 and dynamics were released that took on a life of their own. I was struck by, by one of the stories in the book uh, about the woman who whispered to herself freedom. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and freedom was one of the bywords of the whole Arab Spring, including Absolutely. in Syria. But in Syria, uh, it has an interesting context, mm -hmm. be right? Because the regime, a Ba'athist yeah. regime, yeah. had freedom as I mean, one of the, right. the slogans of the Ba'ath party, right? right? Unity, freedom. Was it the, I mean, was it Horia? Was it the same word that she said in yes. Arabic? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the exact same word that the Ba'ath party used as their right. slogan, unity, freedom, and socialism. Right. What, what do you think freedom meant to her? What did it mean to the other people you talked to who used that word uh -huh. when they, they had been kind of schooled, literally schooled? Right. To, that that word meant a certain thing as part of the Ba'ath Party's slogan. Yeah, well, in many ways it was to, to defying that schooling of having to, to mimic and to say certain right. words that the teacher forces you to say that you don't even understand and you'll be hit on the wrist or have to crawl on your hands and knees if you don't say. I think for most people, 
the, the first and foremost, it meant to be able to speak. It was freedom of expression. It was be able to talk, to talk out loud, to say what you really think, to um, speak without fear. Um, maybe later, had there been more chance to develop a political program, had there been more chance, had the, had the uprising not been met with such brutal violence so quickly, there could have been a greater opportunity to think about a new constitution, political parties, and so forth. And, and um, and some Syrians said, you know, when we said freedom, 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 one of the early regime's responses, what is this freedom you want? Is it the freedom to impose Islamic law? Is it right. the freedom to shatter windows? People said they tried to think of a response and thought, well, we'd like it to have the clause in the Constitution that says that the Ba'ath Party always must be the ruling party of state have that revoked so there can be other political parties, to have meaningful elections, to have more than state-dominated media, to have the emergency law that was put in place in 1963 that allowed security forces basically to arrest or throw anybody in prison without cause or trial because we're in a state of emergency. Well, 50 years right. later, to have that released. So they did have sort of also when Push could think of political, more specific political demands, but on the most human level, it was first and foremost to be able to talk. Mm -hmm. There's not much sectarianism in the book. Yeah. Right? The, the, the people you talk to kind uh -huh. of, they don't think in those terms, and, yeah. and when they're suggested, they play them down. Yes. Yeah. But uh, when we look at the war, we tend to describe it at least as the way the way that it's mm -hmm. worked out in sectarian terms. And yeah. the Alawi community has uh, <coughs> remained relatively united behind this regime. Yeah. Uh, most of the uh, of the groups that have taken up arms against the regime come from the Sunni Muslim community, and you know the the other minority groups tend to be on the fence, but yeah. but not willing to come out against the regime. So. Uh, where does the sectarianism come uh -huh. in in both in the in the narratives that mm -hmm. you that you took and uh -huh. in your analysis? Because uh -huh. I mean, just yeah. in the picture, one, yeah. in one of the pictures where you know I'm trying to look at all the signs and what yeah, they yeah. say, and and there are some the shahada right, right is there? You know, right. there is no god but God, and, and Muhammad is his prophet. Which, if you carry that to a demonstration, you are making not just a statement that you don't like the regime; you're making a statement about what you want the next regime to look. So could, mm -hmm. could you talk a little bit about where you see sectarianism in all of this? Yeah, great. So, so w one thing that came through in, in, in stories, which also resonates with my, uh, with a lot of ways how I look at Syria and at the region, is not sectarianism as much as sectarianization, of sectarianism as a process, not this thing, certainly not this immutable primordial force that's always there that drives people of the Middle East to be, uh, tribal or religious or act on those motivations, that it's a political process um, that's infused with resources and interests and things can be made sectarian. They are just are. And that often sectarianism is a product of violence as much as it is a cause of violence. That bloodshed and anger um, create sectarian feeling more than sectarian feeling creating the violence in the first place. Primarily, I see the violence in Syria as it's beginning until this day as is a struggle for power, for those who have power to hold on to it, for those who want power or want to dislodge power also to use it, that it's, it's the struggle for power that drives violence. And sectarianism and identity in all sorts of different ways becomes part of that, that bloody now struggle for power. So people describe a process of sectarianization. And for the people that I spoke with who are all, for the most part, uh, mostly um, regime uh, opponents, they often blame the regime. They, they blame the regime for deliberately using sectarianism and sectarian identity as a tool, as a part of its, its, its um, strategies for keeping power. That the regime understood that it um, could rally religious minorities with, the, with a rhetoric and a narrative that the uprising is, is driven by the disgruntled Sunni majority. They want to impose Islamic law. They want revenge because they feel like religious minorities have been treated well and protected under this regime. And if this uprising succeeds and the regime is collapsed, the Sunni majority will uh, impose uh, extreme Islamic uh, set of ideas that they had Saudis and other extremists behind them. They're jihadi terrorists. And that rhetoric was used right. very early on. Right. And, um, and many describe how they saw that happen on the streets. And, um, and 
they're for, they put the blame first and foremost with the regime in sectarianizing a conflict in a sort of very cynical strategy to hold on to power using whatever cards it could. Um, but once unleashed, for sure, there are other types of identity-based conflicts that, that come to the fore. Another sort of part of one of the regime's sort of strategies early on, um, or part of the general sort of regime supporters rallying was what became to be known as shabiha, or often plain clothes <coughs> civilians who were overwhelmingly um, Alawi origin, not exclusively, but that being the religious community from which the Assad family comes, often being plain clothes civilians that went out to beat people in protests or to shabiha literally means ghosts. Yeah, to, or to, um, to carry out house raids, and they were along there with uniformed security officers doing a lot of the the dirt, the sort of bloody work to rough up protesters and punish them and discourage them. So for, for many, especially Sunni civilians, they saw it wasn't just the uniformed security officers of the state coming to loot their houses or beat them up or take them off to prison, but civilians. And when the civilians primarily were speaking with an were Alawi speaking with a, a, an accent that from accent, the coast yeah. and so forth, it, was, it became easy to associate this as an Alawite struggle, not just the government and the state against the people. That was one factor that went on. And now, and then when clearly Al-Qaeda becomes involved and in right. signs of that sort could very reasonably make religious minorities be extremely fearful and believe the, the, what the regime was, was saying, that um, this is an increasingly Islamicized rebellion and should it succeed, um, the, either there would be crimes and violence or ethnic cleansing. And in mass destruction and murder of, of religious minorities, and as Al Qaeda's presence grew and grew and grew, and other is Islamist radical spin-offs, that became an increasingly <coughs> real threat. So, for sure, religious minorities, and especially Alawis, are, are reasonably terrified. Right. Let me ask though mm -hmm. uh, about your choices here. Yeah. You didn't identify anybody in this book by their sectarian, yes, right, uh, 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 background, right. So that was obviously a conscious choice. Yeah, right. It, it was. And, and one is that I didn't ask people. So in general, I have an interviewing strategy, and there are many different ways to go about doing interviews and oral histories, um, in which I was extremely open and said, just tell me what this has been like for you. There are people, and I have their real names, and there are people I never even got their, their real names. I didn't ask, and from a social scientist perspective, I wished I had more demographic data. And I could say, uh, what's your highest level of education, yeah, yeah. and what's your age, and so forth, so I could analyze these interviews from a more scientific standpoint. But my primary duty and goal was that my interviewees felt safe and comfortable. And for me, especially in the beginning, that entailed not prying too much. If I said, I want to collect your stories about Syria, and who are you, and what the that would have shut down in a yeah. second. People think, who are you and why are you getting this information? And we already right. thought you were working for somebody, but now we're really sure and we're not talking to you anymore. So, so in many, for many cases, I don't have people's right. sectarian identity because I don't have it unless they mention to it. Now, it might have been obvious in other ways if a woman wore a right. headscarf and that sort of thing. But or if they're from certain towns, you can pretty much identify. Yeah, or it maybe came through in some other ways, or if in the middle of the interview right. someone's like, no, I've got a break to pray, or so yeah. forth. And that, I mean, there, there, there might be other cues, but I certainly didn't have it for everybody in any sort of systematic way. So that's the chief the chief thing. Similarly, age. Yeah. Some people I could kind of guess, but um, but that's something I don't have because I just didn't want to press people because I knew it would make them so uncomfortable. When, so when you mentioned somebody's age, they would have volunteered to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or they would or they gave me some cue of, you know, when I was a kid in, in yeah, the eighties yeah. and that sort of thing. So that's that's the chief reason is is primarily what I had was a name and I either used a pseudonym or somebody gave me their permission. I used the real name and I had what they were where they were from because that's such a, a huge identity marker, almost right. a pillar for, for Syrians. Right. But also frankly sectarianism and sectarian identity usually didn't emerge as so primary in their own stories and, mm -hmm. and leaving it open tell me who you are and what's your story who are you and, and so or just or not even tell me who your story just how has this, this experience been like for you um, sometimes religion would come up in here and there but not nearly at all with the kind of prominence I think most Americans would assume it does because we almost see it primarily many of us see it primarily in sectarian in sectarian terms sometimes it wouldn't come up at all and sometimes it did, and if it, if it was a primary part of their story, I would work it in. 
but it was striking to the degree that it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't often as much as other issues like class, right. which you know we all really think is a class struggle, but a lot of people had had more sort of socioeconomic type grievances or experiences. Mm. Right. Well, I could talk uh, to you for hours about yeah. this stuff, but that would be unfair to our audience. So I want to open it up. I just ask, we, we have microphones on either side. I just ask you to identify yourself to, mm -hmm. to Professor Perlman, and if you're a Bush School student, please tell her that, because, you know, yeah. I, I, like, I like you guys to. Yes, sir. I am Marty Mess. I'm retired. No connection to the Bush School, unfortunately. <laughs> it's all right. It's good you have good community relations yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, That's yeah. great. I would like your, your view on the possibility of an Arabian Spring happening in Saudi Arabia. Maybe I'll defer to the Saudi Arabia <laughs> expert sitting <laughs> next to me. <laughs> well, if it hasn't yeah. happened yet, it's probably not going to happen soon. But you tell no. me. I mean, what do you No, what do you think? no, uh, this is really, you're... I, I've never been in a better position to, to pass the ball on that. So really, don't even try to pass it back. So <laughs> I, I have the I, same question for you. Actually, yeah, I'm just yeah, asking yeah, the yeah, same we were question actually for you talking about that. An yeah, hour ago, yeah so. we were talking about that when we were walking yeah. over. So I, I, I want people to, to hear from, yeah. from Wendy, but but I'll give you the two second answer, which is no. Okay, uh, <laughs> and and if if it didn't happen in 2011, it's not going to happen today. Now, that, does that mean it's not going to happen in five or ten years? You know, we can have a longer conversation about that. But well, the Saudis are in the news these days for all sorts of interesting reasons, but most of it is top-down, not bottom-up. And, and so I, I don't think we're going to see the Arab Spring the way we saw right, it yeah. across the region, which is when I think of Arab Spring, I think of bottom-up, popular yeah. mobilizations against a regime, the, the, the motto of which in every single right. one of them was the people want the fall of the regime. Uh, and and uh, Saudis had a chance to come out. All right, this, this, the Saudi secret police were not more fearful, uh, or, or not more fear-inducing, and more and, and, and more terrifying than the Syrian secret police, or the Egyptian secret police, or the Tunisian secret police. So people in Saudi could have gone out, and, and except for certain areas uh, where the Shia minority were, they really didn't go out. So that's that's my two cents on Saudi. Let's get some stuff on Syria. But, but I would though. say, if you want more, I believe there's a great article in Foreign Affairs called Rageless in Riyadh about yeah. exactly yeah. that <laughs> by, by Greg Gus. So. so, not all at once now, please. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Howdy, my name's Abby Hutton, and I'm an industrial engineering student here at uh -huh. A&M. Our... My profession is all on the planning and the uh -huh. timing of things and how that all works. Right. And First, thank you, Dr. Perlman, for coming and, ta and talking to us today. But can you elaborate a little more on, on how these grassroots movements kind of got their momentum, like these people being drug out into the streets, kind of extra, extra body experiences, right. and, and how maybe they might have had more potency or we might not have the exact situation we have at this moment with a little more planning? That's just fascinating, and you've touched uh -huh. on some of it throughout this, but I'd love to hear you elaborate a little more. Oh, great. No, thanks. I, I mean, I just, because um, I also study social movements, so I'm really fascinated about this, too, because there is something, I think, in, in many cases of real big grassroots swelling, a certain element of unpredictability. Um, uh, you know, some protests are planned, but there's some, you know, the, what gets people out. So there's, there's a series of events in the Syrian context that I find to be really fascinating. So as I said, one, as, as many Syrians watching protests elsewhere in the region begin to talk about it. And many Syrians talked to me about, you know, we began to talk in a slightly more open way. Some people said, you know, we never even said the word Bashar al-Assad out loud. Because you, before, people think, why are you saying the name of the president? But we started to talk. And some people said, you know, we started to talk about Mubarak in Egypt and say, you know, Hats off to the Egyptians, mm -hmm. and we were all wondering, could it happen here? And we were talking about Mubarak, but we all looked at each other's eyes, and we knew we were really talking about Assad. Mm -hmm. And slowly, slowly. So then, then there is um, an, an event uh, of, of a protest um, in which a, a policeman sort of roughs up this guy in the old city or old market of Damascus that leads to a spontaneous swell of people coming to the defense of this man who's just been insulted by a police officer saying that the Syrian people will not be humiliated. And this is captured on cell phones and the, and the, and the image goes around and many people all over see, oh, is this an actual a tiny demonstration? Begins with a flash, but also sort of 
a step breaking the barrier. And then there's a call on March 15th on Facebook saying Syrians go out. March 15th is going to be the launch of the Syrian uprising. So this is about. So this is the fa this is the Facebook element, right? This is the this Facebook is the, element. This is the social media element of yeah, these yeah. of this mobilization. Yeah, and people would say again and again that social media was was crucial. Maybe there wasn't planning, but there was a circulation of information without which this would not have happened. And people talked about the events in the 80s in which there were massacres, but people maybe the next village over didn't know because there were no pictures. But cell phones and uploading on the internet was able to get information out in a way that otherwise things that happened in one community may have stayed there and that would be the beginning and end of it. So on March 15th there's a call that Syrians will be the beginning of the Syrian uprising and many believe that that call was first put out by Syrians outside Syria in the ex in the diaspora who call for it and there's this tentative waiting what will happen on March 15th and there are a few small demonstrations and in, in, in basically in, in, in Damascus maybe a little one in Aleppo that are that are quickly put down but some people are arrested and a few days later there's a demonstration outside the Ministry of, of Justice I believe calling for their release and so forth but there's one little story which I'd never heard besides uh, the Syrians I did be talking about it, how in Dera, the town of southern Syria, well, ultimately there comes a, a, a protest that sort of launches. Right. But he said in, in March 15th, we also planned a protest in, in, in Dera. In Dera. Okay. But what he said was there was some people got together and they said, okay, let's have a protest out in the main square outside the um, uh, sort of municipality building. And people thought, we'll each will go. So this is an element of planning. Everybody will go separately to congregate in that, in that area because if we all come together, they'll know it's a crowd. So everybody came separately. And he said, I came. And I, when I time I got to the major square, it was already surrounded by police officers. Somehow the police officers had gotten word. Maybe there was an informant, a plant, or something. And he said, I got there, and there were so many police officers. I just kept on walking. I didn't even stop. So you can imagine how many other, maybe hundreds, thousands of protests there were all over in which people tried quietly to plan, not even knowing. And I talked to other people that other sort of small groups that planned protests that later found out that one person in the group was a, was a spy and reported on all of them and they all wound up in prison. So there was constant fearfulness. There was the constant threat of, of information, of being... Um, uh, of having someone from the regime come in and, and, and smack things down. So, um, so even the best laid plans could go awry. And then there's a series of other events in which eventually it gets enough people out on the streets. And then in one of the first time that spontaneously enough people got on the streets, two people were killed by security officers. And then you have murders. And then maybe it brings in this, this element of, of whether it's anger or indignation or rage, whether it's the sheer emotional anger or really the feeling of kind of, 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 of righteous indignation of how can they shoot us unarmed protesters? This regime has no legitimacy. I have to go out. I have a duty to go out and stand with the people who've been killed. So once blood is shed, that also brings more people out and things, and things spiral. So, uh, but, but I would say, yes, yeah, social media, I think, was, was key because things couldn't spiral if information didn't make it spiral. Sure. Congressman Flores. Yeah. Dr. Perlman, uh, welcome to Aggieland. I appreciate you uh, coming today. Uh, did your interviews go through uh, the time that the Russians aligned themselves with the uh, Assad regime? Mm -hmm. And if, it, if your interviews did, did you sense a change in tone or resignation or commitment to uh, the, the movement? Yeah, I think, that, I mean, the last, I'm still continuing, continuing to do interviews now, even in Germany, but it, with time, my interviews, um, especially as they've come to Europe, have become more and more focused on the refugee experience. But people continue to reflect and, and watch the events that are happening in Syria. I think with the Russian involvement, as well as with the Iranian involvement and the Hezbollah involvement, there's just a growing sense of despair. So again, again, Syrians with these things, as, as the person I quoted said, you know, it doesn't, that, that the conflict isn't even in our hands anymore. We've become a battlefield for everybody else. It's not up to us. It began as this conflict between citizens and their government and erupted into this regional war or international war, and the odds just become more and more and more stacked against the people who called, who called for change. So there is, a, I think, a real sense of despair um, fighting the Assad regime and all the allies that... Um, are up against uh, that are that are with him. So, 
people would also often reiterate, you know, this regime would have fallen were it not for it, the allies that have propped it up. There's a very much an awareness of that. And the people can point to various things at the, the timeline, especially the Russian intervention in 2015, had there not been that. And of course, there's been military intervention and economic intervention and political intervention in the UN Security Council and so forth. But had R Russia, Iran, and the other allies not been there to do what it takes to prop up the Assad regime, he surely would have, would have fallen. And so maybe at the beginning when people rushed out into the streets didn't fully think about how the geopolitical dynamics of the Syrian context are different than Tunisia or perhaps Egypt. But very much there's, there's that, that sense. And as well with it, there's also a lot of bitterness towards the West and a lot of bitterness towards the United States and the international community and, and all those who say, <coughs> yeah, Russia and Iran propped up this regime, but who's with us? Who's helping us? Where, um, where's this, you know, responsibility to protect? And where's this principle of never again to mass atrocities? And people say, and we went out into the streets and called for freedom and democracy. And you Americans were always saying you're in favor of democracy. We thought you'd have our back when people came out and started shooting us. So uh, there's there's a sense of all the different international players and how they've played in. And and uh, this the situation I think yet yeah, leaves most Syrians feeling. Um, a lot of frustration and not knowing where the out is, where's the exit strategy, and what is any glimmer of hope given that. In the refugee communities where you mm -hmm. talk to people, yeah. is there a sense of depolitization? Is there a sense, uh -huh. you know, we wash our hands of this, even though, uh -huh. you know, it's our country, and, and but we're so tired and, and, and so so ineffective in doing anything that we just, we're done with politics. I do find some, I mean, they're different. I think people go through different stages and, and different, um, and backs and forths in their relationship to it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, there's so much despair. Um, and I think that many people feel like, what can I do? And I'm so lucky to have survived. And the life of being a, coming a refugee is also overwhelming. I mean, I talk right. to, to, Germ to people in Germany now, and their lives are consumed with the German bureaucracy and learning the language. Like, what time do they have to think about what's happening in, in Idlib because they have to go wait to get a paper stamp for their health insurance right. and so forth. So, um, and, and I think it's also uh, because it's, it's um, because it does cause just so much tremendous dismay. But at the same time, people can never divorce themselves from it fully. Their eyes are still on the news. There's you know, constant messages coming up on their phones about the latest news breaks. Many still have family in Syria that they are right. worried to death about. Um, and for many people also, there's even those who've made it to relative safety and security, there's, as I said, often a sense of, 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 of guilt, um, of why am I still alive and I've made it here, and all those who haven't, and those who, who are starving, or those who are waiting in the cold, or those who are, who, who are no longer here, that, as, as one man said to me, you know, I'm here in the heart of Europe, and I've made it, but my conscience just kills me. And I, so even I think people try to put some thoughts behind them simply so they can get on with life and for many so they can focus on their children but are, they can never fully forget are there differences between the refugees that you talk to in Europe and those who are in Turkey or Lebanon and Jordan who are right on the border yeah absolutely I think those who may in Europe have a path ahead whereas right. those in in the border countries are in many of them a state of limbo where they don't have permanent legal status right. their guests legally in Turkey, Jordan, or Lebanon. They might not have the right to work legally, probably do not. Um, they uh, do not see necessarily a path for a clear future. Um, and they thought their lives there would be quite temporary. Right, right. Um, but now temporary has been one year, two yeah, years, three years, seven years, years, and so yeah. forth. So there is the struggle of how do you move on, but the basic legal apparatus for them to move on legal permanent residency, legal rights to work, um, in some ways, you know, full access to education and so right, forth. Which they're not going to get in these countries, right? They're not going to get that in Turkey. They're not going to get that in Lebanon. Yeah. They're not going to get it in Jordan. And that's, yeah. and that's what, three, four, five million Syrians, right? Yeah, that's the overwhelming, the overwhelming bulk. Um, right. Yeah, I don't know what I would, I don't know, to never say never because right, right. Right. This this could be how many decades long experience. I mean, my first 
when it first began to really click for me, I visited the Lazathari refugee camp in, in, Jordan. in Jordan. That was yeah. that began in sort of summer 2012, and I visited it in summer 2012, and it was still pretty small. I mean, there were just a few t tens of thousands of, of refugees. There were tents and so forth. It was sort of haphazardly created in, in the desert. And uh, there seemed to me to be no order. It was all sort of tense and a lot of dust. And I remember there was one woman I spoke with, um, and I thought, I, she, she just very much impressed me, this young woman. And I said, you know, how can I get in touch with you again if I ever want to find you? Um, and she took out a piece of paper, and she wrote something like, Tent 33, Street 42, or something of that sort. And, and that's when it clicked to me, oh, my goodness. This is the creation of something which might become quite enduring, if not permanent. Now, of course, Zachary has like 80,000 people, right. full right. on urban planning, different, re different neighborhoods right. and, and commercial districts and so forth, the fourth largest town in, 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 Jordan. in Jordan. But even at that point, very early when people said, our bags are packed, we're going to go back any minute. It already had the indications. So I think that... Um, the, well, we the, know what happened to Palestinian refugee camps in and that Jordan have just become part of cities. Right? That's, and yeah. That is precisely went through, went through my, my, my head at the time. So um, I think that Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey have, would absolutely not would be thrilled to have the Syrian refugee population disappear. But given the reality is it's probably not anytime soon, everyone has to start thinking about more more permanent right. solutions so, so individuals can get on with their lives. Right. Yes, here, on the on the aisle, please. Microphone? Oh, oh, we have one back here. Yeah. Uh, have I lost control of this? Okay, <laughs> yeah, please go right ahead. Dr. Perlman, <coughs> Robert Rose. Um, hope to be retired soon, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, I had the question that Obviously, everything you say, it brings up about 10 other questions. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, is there a desire for a form of democracy, and, and what would that look like? Would that look more similar to an American system, or would it look more similar to a British, British system, or what would that form of democracy look like, if, if, if that's what's wanted by the mm -hmm. people? And the other question I had, uh, what would you... Uh, convey to um, our leaders as far as uh, how, how do we start the process of moving from a military solution to a political solution? What, what needs to happen to start a peaceful resolution of this situation? Yeah, great, great questions. Um, I think as far as the first one, um, as I was saying before, I, I think that there wasn't necessarily the space to even begin thinking about a planning for what the shape of a democratic system would look like. I mean, as people said to me, you know, we were never expecting this opportunity, and then we went out, and we said freedom, and we knew we wanted freedom, and we said dignity because we knew we wanted dignity, and we didn't want, we wanted an end to corruption, and we wanted there to be some accountability, but after that, we didn't really know. So I think there was a sense of wanting to have a system where there was a rule of law, where uh, those who had power could not abuse it limitlessly, where freedom of speech would be protected, where people could go to a government office and not feel like they were being belittled and demeaned. The most basic sort of sense would be a, a person treated with respect. But an actual form of government, I don't think that Syrians got to the point where they were even allowed to think in such terms, because they were first just barely saying, <coughs> freedom and the bullets started flying. But there's been work by other Syrians um, in exile and so forth that tried to put together plans for what a transition would look like. A colleague of ours, um, Steve Heidemann, when he was at the U.S. Institute for Peace, worked on this program called the Day After Project, in which groups of exiled Syrians came together with, to make a blueprint of what would the day after an Assad government look like. What would be the plan of reform for the security forces? What would be the plan for the reform of the education sector? What would be the move towards elections and so forth? So there were a lot of really smart, concerted people working on, on these topics, but meanwhile the battlefield situation was thousand steps ahead of them and that kind of those ideas have never had a chance to be implemented and now it's a question of when will this war end and on what terms and it increasingly looks at the Assad regime as consolidating its power and, and the day after the Assad regime is it seems increasingly far away. So I think there were thoughts and there would be more, had there ever been a chance to devise these types of uh, ideas 
I think it would have been thrilling to see the Syrian people come together and for the first time determine their own fate. Um, so I don't think it was a problem of lack of ideas. It was the facts on the ground made those ideas almost irrelevant to, to the story. Which I guess brings to the second question of so where from here, and it's interesting to think about what would be a political or a, a peaceful resolution apart from the military resolution. I mean, unfortunately, I see that the, the events is being primarily determined on the battlefield at this point, that this, the Assad regime has shown that it's willing to use any type of force to stay in power and won't give up force and won't make concessions and won't share power, I think, unless, unless forced, unless there's real leverage uh, that would put pressure on the regime to move towards a, a new transitional kind of form of government. So what could be the sources of those leverage? I mean, the U.S. has tried economic sanctions and peace negotiators, and I mean, ultimately, it seems to be a military bat fight that's being fought on the battlefield, and, f and f military pressure might be the only kind of viable pressure to force a transition, but that military option, as we've seen so far, has also failed. Um, for various reasons. Maybe there was not a concerted enough use to really go with the military option. There was always sort of, I think that part of the, maybe the strategy of the Obama administration was maybe enough kind of military pressure to try to coax uh, uh, a move towards a transition. But the Assad regime and its allies um, have uh, been able to withstand and outsmart and ultimately slowly crush uh, opposition place by place and regain territory that it had once lost to rebels, um, whether it's... Although probably yeah. unable to restore its authority over the whole country, right? Yeah. I mean, we're going to see the Lebanonization of Syria, right? Right. right. So that, that's a great question of what, of what comes next. Some say that the Assad regime, regime seems to have won if its goal was to still stay there. It hasn't been overthrown. So if, on those terms, it succeeded in not being overthrown. But will it be able to rule again? where and how, um, if there's no longer a live armed rebellion and civil war, will violence take other forms like IEDs and bus explosions and who knows where? I don't think the violence is over anytime right. soon, um, but there's, a vi there's a, an element of, uh, of force on the ground that I don't know if any political process can work in, in, in absence of, I think, recognition of that, of that reality, sadly. Um, we're, we're coming up on the yeah. close. There were a few questions. What I'd like to do is just collect maybe the two or Excellent. three hands that I saw. And yeah. Wendy, you could have the last word. I, uh, there was a hand here on the aisle, please. <laughs> My name is Ashley Carter. I'm also at the Bush School. And uh -huh. I just had a question. If you got to interview any of the children or teenagers mm -hmm. with these families and kind of what they saw as their future being a displaced generation and growing up in these areas, that they may never get to go home. And this, they're going to be Syrian, but they're also going to be these countries that they're not living in. What does that look like? Did I see another hand over? Yes, right here, Mr. Lamb. I am Alex Lamb, also at the Bush School. I was wondering about, since it seems unlikely that many of the refugees will ever go home, are, there, are they making steps towards accepting the situation, perhaps adapting in ways beyond just learning the language and collecting medical insurance? Mm -hmm. And does that differ from place to place? I yeah. think it would be a really interesting question. Uh, one more here, and then we're going to yes. Hi, I'm Jordan Medica, Medica, also from the Bush School. Yeah. And um, our capstone is doing a UNICEF non-formal education program for Syrian refugee children in Lebanon. And so oh, wow. I kind of wanted to take the opportunity to ask you if you could touch on, um, I think she just asked about like the children's experience, especially as refugees um, in the Middle East, and maybe particularly their education. Our capstones are uh, uh -huh. second semester, second year uh, group project that is uh, uh, kind of the hopefully bringing together everything you've learned at the school to produce a, mm -hmm. a, a, a research project uh, for a, a real world client. In this case, your capstone, Ms. Medic, is working for UNICEF, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's great. So one is that I, I didn't usually do interviews with teenagers or children. Um, there's actually sort of, you know. There's uh, IRB yeah, issues Yeah, there's there. IRB about the ethics yeah. of, of interviewing um, minors. But I was often in settings where I was interacting with kids, or I would be in a family setting, and I would get to see and hang out with the kids. And um, I, I taught for a volunteer a small um, uh, a program by the, the, the sort of Chicago-based Karen Foundation and 
in, um, in Turkey, so I taught uh, Syrian teenagers for a week and that sort of thing. So I've hung around with, with kids and teenagers and gotten some sense. And then in, 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 um, now in, in Germany as well. And there are, I guess there are, there are a few different things. On, on, on the one hand, I think there are real issues of post-traumatic stress for kids who've experienced witness violence, experienced violence, and that comes out in different ways of kids who are having, either I've seen kids or, or heard about kids who have, you know, fears of loud sounds or fears of going too fast in the car and you know, the, the fear that the, having experienced violence stays with them in ways that, that, or, you know, behavioral issues, bedwetting, I mean, there's the full range of, 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 a, of a generation that has experienced this that will, has left its imprint on their brains and their psyches in ways that we have to continue to grapple with. Right. And, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a full literature on this in the Middle East because yes. there's quite a bit of work done uh, on, on Lebanese children uh, from the experiences of the Civil War that... Yeah, absolutely. Is unfortunately relevant. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And in, in the Syrian case, maybe even the more dramatic, the kinds of violence of, of aerial bombardment, chemical weapons. I mean, you you name it. It's it's all it's all been there. Having witnessed body parts and sort of. I mean, these are the, these things that many kids have have seen. So that is one real issue: the post traumatic stress. On the other hand, kids are amazingly re resilient, and you guys have it, seen kids have probably seen. I mean, um, in some ways, maybe children are lucky that maybe they, um, they experience things at a time when they're, they will maybe remember less than people older. I mean, I, it's, this is what I found in, in Germany, which I, found, which, I, which I wasn't necessarily expecting, is that, is that kids who often got out with young enough that they don't have fully formed memories and they're able to move forward. And parents or middle-aged folks who have are overwhelmed with their sense of loss, but can put hope in their children. Many parents that say things like, my life is over, it's done. Everything that I was no longer exists. Everything that I built has been destroyed, but I have hope in my children. What I found, which I wasn't expecting, is a kind of a middle strata of people in their sort of their, their late teens, 20s, early 20s, who aren't yet living with kids, but we're, what, we're aware enough to know everything, to have experienced every memory, to have a sense of the Syria they lost that maybe kids don't really have because they don't have a whole years or decades of a relationship with Syria, so they don't necessarily feel the loss of Syria. They barely remember Syria. That, um, that people in that sort of the, the, the middle, young people, um, feel really sometimes the most lost because they don't have a, a purpose yet of marriage and kids um, but they have memories they can't shake. Um, so, uh, so, so kids are, I think, are, are absolutely a huge issue. But there's also people have different. There are different sources of loss and trauma and pain that each different age group has, and you know, adults and, and people of other ages suffer a lot too. And maybe there's not as enough attention to them because um, we think of them as maybe being less vulnerable than children. But they also have their own source of pain, which can be quite quite tremendous. Um, going going back, um, oh, about sort of how people see their lives going, going forward. Again, I think in the border countries, it's really stunted by the sense of the legal ceiling. Um, in uh, y yeah, it's hard to be able to plan for a future when your 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 status is not even you know is, is only semi is semi legal. Um, as far as is uh, people people I've, Syrians I've met in in Europe, I think there very much is a sense of whether whether or not people know they'll go home or think they'll go home, like the future's too far to predict and is so incredibly unknowable. But what people know is the current and the present, which is if they've made it to Europe, they have some sort of opportunity. If they've made it to the United States, many feel like they have to t make the most of it because who knows. Many people I talk to in Europe also have the sense that maybe they will be um, forced out of Europe. There are no guarantees. They're, they're waiting for a day when maybe the international community says, well, the civil war in Syria is now over. There's been time some sort back. of resolution, and your visa is now expired, and it's time for you to leave Germany and go home or Sweden or whatever. People are very much afraid of, of that. Legally, it could happen at any time. So even nobody's residence is guaranteed anywhere. So you wonder how difficult it is to learn the language and be job retrained and figure out a new profession and so forth and go forward and put your kids through school and plan for the future, knowing that at any moment it could disappear. But what else can you do? 
what else can you do? I think many people just say. The, what, yeah, the specific the educational yeah, yeah. atmosphere in Lebanon. In, in Lebanon. So, um, so you probably, I, have you actually been to Lebanon yet or are you guys headed? Oh, more. fantastic. It'll be. If I sign the right form. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> it will be a life changing experience. So I wish you all the most and best and I'm excited for you to, to have that. The situation in Lebanon is absolutely dire. I mean, as, as we know, it's, it's about as bad as you can, as you can imagine. So the, Le the Lebanese will not allow official uh, UNHCR, UN, UN High Commissioner for um, Refugee Camps, because they don't want them to become a permanent camp as the, pa as the, as Palestinians, the Palestinians did. did. So instead you have a series of informal camp settlements, which can be 10 tents or 20 tents in a field. People are often just renting by the square meter from some landlord to have some space and have some sort of tent. Um, so in, in many ways, as bad as a refugee camp is, at least with that critical mass, you're able to have services, a clinic, a school. And, and, interna and international agencies. That international can agencies those, uh, and services. aid when you have an officially recognized UN camp of 10,000 people. But when you have 15 tents in an abandoned field by the highway, it's harder to reach those communities for the most basic services. So things like school and health care are all the more difficult to, to, to access. When I visited some of these, these um, attempts during my trips in Lebanon, there were stories about how <coughs> cooking fire could begin in one camp because somebody left something on the, on the fire too long and it burned down a whole series of camps. So they're just tremendously vulnerable given um, given the geography and the spacing of where, where things are. Um, so education, I guess, is, is part of that whole story of how difficult it is to reach these refugee communities, really how tremendously, tremendously vulnerable there are. Many Syrians... And, but also yeah. in Lebanon, how, how huge they are, right? I mean, yes. that's 20% of the Lebanese population yes. now is Syrian refugees. Yeah, something like one in five, almost yeah. one in four people, residents in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee. Imagine if one in five of us here was a Syrian refugee, so it's absolutely <laughs> overloaded. And the legal situation is quite quite difficult, too, where many Syrian refugees are, are technically illegal. I've talked to many Syrian refugee men in Lebanon that are afraid to travel from one town to another if they might hit a, a Lebanese army checkpoint and find out that their papers are technically out of, out of work and maybe they'll, they, they feel they're going to be deported and sent back to Syria. So. Um, and the work situation is, is, is horrific. I mean, just every indicator of life, legal status, work, education, health, it's, 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 all, it's all tremendously dire. So I think in that sense, um, I would just see education as part of that, that larger picture from people's living conditions to their legal status, of um, all a part of the, of the, the, the composite that shaping these families um, and their sense of who they are and their futures. But of course, you'll be perfectly safe when you go out there. So the yeah, university yeah. won't have any problem with you coming. No, no, no. Because yeah, especially when you're a foreigner, Lebanon can be a really fun and great yeah, and yeah, great actually, place. Yeah, but yeah. Um, but for the, the refugees are really are really suffering. So please join me in thanking Professor Perlman. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne.